Hey everybody, I am back with uh, the per, uh, penultimate X-Men review event. And since the last comic book event that I covered would have been the X-Men Noir universe, or at least the Noir Marvel universe, focused on the X-Men, which you can check out up on my YouTube channel. Links are in the description below. Smash that like button. Uh, share this with your friends. Let me know in the comics, uh, comments which member of the X-Men is your favorite, which is your least favorite, all that stuff. Do you have a favorite X-Men story, comic, whatever? Let me know. And so, uh, after this, I'm finally going to go right into House of X and Powers of X since the Fall of X just wrapped up. And it's really a crying shame because the, the entire X-Men Krakoa event that we had for a good couple of years has been phenomenal. I know Hickman was one, you know, you know, at the reins of it. And I guess he, you know, he wanted to be done with it. He told what he wanted to tell, but... It's like, could just left it be and somebody else could come in. Because you left a good foundation where people can just, like, veer off, do their own thing, but still keep the core thing that you started from. Instead of just throwing a baby out with the bathwater just because, like, oh, the X-Men is going to be back into the MCU. People remember the 90s X-Men more fondly. So we need to get back to that status quo so people won't get confused. And it's like, we could have just kept the whole entire thing separate. Like, the comics can be their own thing because they, it's like a healthy progression with the X-Men. And everything else could just, they want to go back to the 90s, you know, form and let them do that. But, you know, I don't want to read that in my comics anymore. If I wanted to read 90s X-Men stuff, I can just go back and find some 90s X-Men rather than just going back to that old status quo that, you know, has been beaten to death at this point, at least in the comics. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. Anyway, so uh, we're into the Ultimate Universe, the OG Ultimate Universe, not the new one they just started up again. The same where same dimension where Miles Morales originally came from, where Ultimate Peter Parker originally from, where in this universe, all the superheroes that we know of, you know, would have been established or gotten their powers early on into the, you know, uh, late 90s into the 2000s, rather than way back into the 40s and 60s. So, uh, I gotta say, off the bat, the art in this is phenomenal. But I think I haven't read the Ultimates, which is the Ultimate Avengers. They don't call themselves the Avengers; they call themselves the Ultimates. Uh, which originally they were more very kind of a holes in a way, but the new Ultimate lineup that they just starting up, and they just put out the well, they've been put out the first issue of the new Ultimates line for the brand new Ultimate Universe and they want to do it right this time uh, so because aside from Spider-Man the Marvel Ultimate Marvel Universe has not been doing you know hadn't done so hot in the past and a lot of stuff you know the storylines didn't make sense or it was just like Whatever, it wasn't very cohesive. Uh, I kind of want them to do that with the Marvel 2099 lineup, where, like the Ultimate Universe, only Spider Man seemed to be the more, more successful one. I think Dune 2099 was pretty good from what I hear. I never read it. But I figured, like, okay, let's, now that we have better appreciation, uh, let's give like a futuristic Doctor Doom or futuristic Daredevil or futuristic Doctor Strange some love and see what you can do in the future and then just like how in the Ultimate Universe the new one you're uh, correcting your mistakes and make sure that 
you have um, competent writers to make solid stories for this new Ultimate Universe. You can do the same for the Noir Universe and the Marvel 2099. Some think it's still like a universe, but I think the vast majority, like me, consider 2099 to be like a like legit future of the Marvel Universe 616. But anyway, uh, so we begin where Sentinels, because there's, I'm covering two arcs uh, in this like, uh, I think it was like 12 or 13 issues, because it's like 100 issues and I wasn't going to read the entire thing, but I'm covering two arcs here. And the first arc is called Tomorrow People. Where mutants are, you know, not sure how well known they have been for a while. It should be like a considerable amount. But around this time, this, this is where uh, the X-Men are starting to form. Quite differently from, uh, slightly different from how we used to remember in the past where the X-Men was first formed. And slight alterations of the lineup. So, um, Sentinels has been jettisoned to, uh, California, where it's just immediately annihilating folks with X genes right in the middle of the street, in broad daylight, in front of everybody, you know, and just horrific. I didn't have the slide here because I didn't know, like, how, like, because they didn't shy away from the brutality, so I don't think I can post it on YouTube or even Twitch, let alone YouTube. Uh, so now, Magneto showing up on, you know, taking over TV broadcasting, uh, letting everybody know, oh, oh, it's on. Since you just annihilated my people in cold blood, so we're gonna, like, uh, I'm gonna, uh, you know, set up like we're gonna like it's, uh, set up arms. We're gonna uh, uh, handle our business too. While war is kind of brewing at this point, where Magneto's amassing his forces, uh, we see a Hank McCoy at a bar again. You know, this kind of reminds me of the first X-Men movie, which, by the way, the ultimate X-Men, the first X-Men film was kind of based off of the ultimate X-Men because it was like leaning into the whole black leather kind of attired, more tactical rather than the colorful suits that we are more privy to. And I think, you know, looking back, it was from for our detriment. I think up to the point of X Men First Class, we look back on it around that time, and it's like, man, that was to our detriment. Where at that time, Hollywood wasn't like too comfortable. Like, how can we market this? How can we? They wasn't embracing the com- comic bookiness. They was trying to make everything so grounded because not many characters can pull off colorful outfits while they're looking kind of goofy and didn't think the masses or at least the general audience would be gravitating towards that. It wasn't until like around the MCU time or when we're in the thick of it of the MCU where people are a lot more comfortable with embracing the comic book silliness and the colorful costumes, especially after Spider-Man, Homecoming, and uh, the first Deadpool movie, they will be more inclined. Okay, we can do this without it, you know, being ashamed of it kind of thing. But you look at the costumes here, you see like, oh, wow, you can see the inspiration they got from the first X-Men film. But I bring up the first X-Men film because the way Beast or Hank McCoy is dealing with this... uh, uh, bar patron hassling him because clearly he's a mutant because how big he looks and everything like that. 
and the, with the acrobatic things he can do. Uh, and then, you know, Hank easily kind of dispatched that dude. And then the bartender, like, puts a shotgun at his face and kind of reminds me of Wolverine and the first X-Men movie where, like, he got hassled by a patron and then the bartender puts a gun on him and it's like he was hassling me what are you talking about I was like and then he's just like I don't care you're a freak whatever so that's when a young and this people's being there like teenage years or late teens a lot of them getting into their 20s sure whatever you see like uh, Jean Grey uh, doing the recruiting of the first roster of X-Men. So she picks up Beast. She picks up Aurora Monroe, who is locked up in a, in a jail cell uh, because she was doing all the pickpocketing and everything like that. Because you still got to keep that whole thief motif of her young years. But she's not, the only difference is now, she's not found in Africa. Or Kenya, I think she's originally from, more specifically. So I guess it's a little bit more convenient. So see, uh, uh, Jean brainwashes the uh, cop to, you know, uh, release a, a Storm in her custody so they take off and I like the honestly this is probably like the best you know illustration of the use of psychic abilities I ever seen because you see well Gene and Xavier do have like different color schemes to their little uh, mind controls or whatever and it shows these bubbly little tingly things on a person's head. And for some reason, I really like the look of that. I don't know why. It just, I don't, I never seen, at least from my recollection, I never seen anybody replicate that. And I think that's like a perfect illustration of somebody's mind being messed with. And each one should have like a distinctive look to it from the other. Then uh, she picks up Colossus, who's been uh, is like, uh, working for these uh, mafia, uh, Russian mafia goons t to help pay uh, for his family at home to get funds. Because uh, it, it was brought up because it was some go something going on in Russia and these mafia goons helped them out in exchange Colossus, you know, works for them in order to get his family, like, uh, away from any kind of tragedy back home that's going on in Russia. But then the Russian, the Russians get ambushed by some rival gangs, but because of his organic steel mutation, he's able to survive. But Gene finds him she gives him a hug and, and recruits him to the X-Men. So, the you know, and they meet up with Cyclops, who's the leader. Uh, they get called in to meet the professor, who uh, explains to them about, like, what they are, wh who he is, and, and the dream of peaceful... Uh, coexistence between humanity and homo superior and that's when he sends them on their first mission to pick up a young Bobby Drake who in this particular issue where we first you know uh, meet him he seems like almost like a 10 to 12 year old but in later issues he seems a little bit more like 15 which is kind of like I don't know, man, it's like a thing with the illustration that gives him like a weird appearance, like he's younger in the first issue rather than, you know, maintain that through the rest. But, or just at the very least, show him looking like a 15-year-old because he honestly doesn't because 
because of the short stature, stature and skinny frame, he just comes across like a, a 12 year old rather than somebody like maybe 15 or 16 as we see him being depicted in later issues. I don't know. So he runs away because once he discovers his mutation, he fears Sentinels coming after him and hurting his family in the process. So he decides to run before that even come across because the Sentinels are just showing up, you know, randomly, well, not randomly, but, uh, you know, like uh, state to state and just starting annihilating mutants right off the street, you know, unimpeded. So, f on their first mission, they do okay-ish, but they're not, like, that in sync yet. Like, we typically see the X-Men, because they, most of them don't have their full control of their powers. And especially Storm, who takes out a lot of Sentinels with one lightning strike, but what we normally know, Storm can easily do a lot of things but in her younger years, she can barely pull off like a giant lightning bolt without passing out, uh, which she does. And we see Cyclops really doing his thing. Like, he's cool, guys. He's actually pretty dope. And he acts like a, which we never see ever, you know, ever. But this is the first time I actually see Cyclops having like, you know, written very well. Uh, put in the fact that yeah, people think like, oh, I can't, I can't access my powers if I don't press this button on my visor, but I have mechanism in my glove so where I can like just press something and I can you know automatically release a quick beam shot without having to press the visor in case somebody try to bound my hands. Even though we never see them utilize this ever since, but only read like in the first dozen issues so it's like who knows it's maybe just uh well he probably would have done that again later on but I, I really wish this was incorporated a lot more in a lot of x-men stories because uh cyclist you know does get bound up every once in a while and it's like it'd be a quick thing for him to just get out if he press that mechanism anyway he takes down uh, a sentinel and Bobby even steps in to freeze all the rest of them. But then some ungrateful New Yorkers throws bottles at him. Lucky he's, you know, iced up. Completely ungrateful the fact that they saved them from being crushed to death by these sentinels or sustaining any kind of collateral damage. But then a runaway. And Cyclops is just getting very just bitter. Meanwhile, uh, once word got out about the X Men, Magneto sees like, okay, it looks like my friend Charles uh, is mowing up some recruits of his own. I can't have him getting in my way, so he needs to be taken out. So he sends. Wolverine to deal with that to deal with him because he's an expert assassin an infiltrator and uh, of course we know later that he escaped like the Weapon X program but Magneto got him before Xavier because quite different from like the uh, main timeline where Professor X picked up Wolverine from Alpha Flight because Alpha Flight recruited uh, Wolverine right after he escaped from uh, the Weapon X facility and he was working for Alpha Flight for the Canadian government for quite some time before he got tired of the red tape and then he uh, I covered this in my Giant Size X-Men review so you can check that out in depth but here in this universe Magneto picked him up right away after the whole events of escaping the Weapon X facility. So, uh, he can count on Wolverine to get it on the inside uh, and worm his way in without Xavier picking up on the idea 
that something is amiss until it's too late. Uh, so he, he shows up at the airport with uh, some handler and he gets ambushed and taken out by John Rafe who if you don't recall X-Men Origins Wolverine he was played by Will I Am who's a mutant teleporter and I think it's the same way in the main timeline and I think he is black uh, I'm not sure what nationality he is here in the Ultimate Universe because he seems like, you know, an Arab, Persian, Mexican, something like that. It doesn't like seem like black, black. But um, here he doesn't have any mutant abilities. He's like a straight up human, military guy, and trying to get back his escape B. And John Wraith is like a piece of work, man, because he is just completely abusive towards any mutants uh, he come across. So he takes back uh, Wolverine, and they're en route back to the facility. But uh, Xavier picks up on this at the, because the whole entire thing comes out, you know, that this uh, ambush happens right in front of that airport. So Xavier sends his team to rescue Logan. Even though Gene and Cyclops are skeptical because they know this dude, uh, you know, has some issues. And not something that typically uh, they wouldn't think Professor would be okay with bringing along on the team. But they go, and they stop the convoy and begin to break Wolverine out. There's a cool lineup here. So as they help Wolverine escape, he goes to chase after John Wraith, and... You see, like, John has, like, all these scars in front of his face. It's always been left by Wolverine. And so when Wolverine catches up with this dude, he begins to try to take him out. Even though Gene is asking him, like, no, we're not going to do this thing here. We know what they put you through, but this isn't the way. And, of course, he ain't trying to listen to her. He's about to straight up murder this dude in front of them. So she used her telekinetic powers to toss him into a, a tree to knock him out but she's not like you know all thrilled to the fact that she saved this piece of garbage who commit unknown atrocities towards uh her species so she just knocks him completely out and they take wolverine back to the mansion and while Wolverine's being trained uh, by Xavier at, at the in the danger room, he clearly blatantly just flirting in front of uh, flirting with Jean right in front of Cyclops, and this is like, you know, I'm glad that thanks to at least around House of X, Powers of X comics, and since then moving on. Up until more recently, X Men '97, there's a lot more respect put on Wolverine, uh, uh, put on Cyclops's name, because the whole thing about him being a cock and, you know, uh, uh, got stick in the mud and everything like that—that that is just like a long, overused joke that didn't seem warranted. And writers like to treat Cyclops like in the past, like a tune, like uh, a stick in the mud and not charming or appealing at all because that's just not fair to the character because we all love Wolverine and it became like a long running thing where he's main center of attention because he's the rebel bad boy that everybody likes and it's like yeah we gotta you know I'm glad that more recently we've been like you know using Wolverine sparingly rather than him taking over the spotlight altogether so, 
uh, news reports shows that uh, Magneto you uh, had his Brotherhood of Evil Mutants uh, kidnap the president's daughter. So the X-Men goes to try to rescue the president's daughter. And of course the Brotherhood consists of Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch, Blob, Toad, and Ma uh, Mastermind. And so the team shows up and the fight is, you know, really, really good. And I love the designs like, like of everybody here. They're, so far throughout these two uh, issue arcs, uh, not two issues, but two arcs in this uh, uh, 12 issue run that like I, these 12 issues that I read, uh, the art has been phenomenal. Uh So, everybody's trying to do their part, trying to rescue the president's daughter while trying to deal with a Brotherhood member. And it's Wolverine who manages to pick her up, despite the fact that he's supposed to be there as like a double agent. But to keep up appearances, he has to do the heroic thing. And literally, he wasn't taking anything so seriously because... Before they get into the fight, he literally stops off to go pee somewhere. And then as uh, Quicksilver is running by, he sees Wolverine step out of the corner. And it's like, you know, what are you doing? And he says something, but the, the maintainer's cover, he, you know, knocks out Quicksilver. While he's literally, like, pulling up his pants <laughs> after he was just finished peeing. It was really funny. So, uh... Uh, he ends up getting the president's daughter while one of the members of the X-Men, I forget which one, takes the Blackbird to position itself off a cliff so uh, Wolverine drives off it and lands inside. Uh, man, real daredevil. So they end up rescuing the president's daughter, but then on a whole separate mission... Uh, they're dealing with these terrorist groups or something. And while they end up being pinned down and literally Beast is hurt from an explosion and Storm is freaking out and barely can conjure up a, a sleet of snow, uh, Magneto shows up and literally tosses a train on these guys, on the bad guys. And... Uh, he ends up chewing out Cyclops and, by extension, Xavier, because he thinks these are little kids. They don't know, you know, what's going on, and they're being used by Xavier because, you know, there's the whole concept of peace of coexistence isn't possible. And I love this design of his suit here. It's very updated, uh, at least for the time, um, Magneto costume. So... They help the brother help Beast into the X Men's vehicle so that way they can get uh, go get him some medical assistance because they're all around in this two arcs they're setting up uh, McCoy to be like the true blue Beast. Then you know things really go awry when you know after uh, Gene uh, helps. Uh, uh, men, um, Hank, uh, men them back together again. She goes on a walk in, in the mansion's garden with uh, Wolverine, who's, uh, you know, saying all the nice things to her and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, she knows that this dude is trouble, even though she can't fully read his mind. Uh, she don't completely trust him, but... She admits like she's very infatuated with him, and I'm sorry. Sometimes Gene, oh, I hate to hesitate to say this, but just certain behaviors, it's like she belongs to the streets. I'm sorry. That is just like you got like a du good dude, and then like as soon as the bad boy with the motorcycle shows up, you quickly jump into the sack. That is just after. 
them with this batch of slides here. So Scott is already kind of upset at the fact that, you know, one of his teammates got seriously hurt on his watch and he feels like completely responsible because he's supposed to be the leader. And on top of that, this new uh, dude is, you know, hooking up with my girlfriend and it's like, I, I can't stay here. And like, you know, and then on top of all that, humanity is not grateful for the fact that we literally went out the way because he sees Xavier, you know, getting praise from the president's aide for rescuing the daughter and everything like that. And he thinks like, oh, oh I'm glad you, you are a good little boot, bootlicker and everything like that. He, Psych is just completely like kind of fed up. Everything is piling on top and he just, you know, about to reach a breaking point. And... Xavier is trying to explain to him that this is all in like a, a strategic move in order to, you know, cause if we get in good graces of the president, who knows how higher up we can get where now we're in, in a position where, you know, he's ceasing all sentinel activity, uh, because it was mutants who saved his daughter. Even though there was also mutants who kidnapped him, kidnapped her in the first place. So, uh, but they reason a good point, but they reason a good point in like human relations. But Cyclops is not trying to hear it. So, and many people, as soon as I read this panel, I can't help but hear about so many people co complain about Xavier and how he quickly misuses powers for his own benefit without care or kind of callously to fit his own end. And this is kind of like proving their point uh, where he just blatantly manipulated Scott's mind to make sure he's kept calm because he knows he's about to, you know, say something crude and about to potentially get into a big fight. And he's just kind of like, nip that in the bud, make sure you release all the pleasure centers so that way, you know, we won't say anything we ain't gonna uh, take back kind of thing. But Scott just still dips off, like, might not get into an argument because, like, you know, mentally I can't. So I'm just gonna piss off because, you know, I can't deal with this crap. And then he goes running to Magneto saying, like, you know, I, you know, because I, I can't see Xavier's thing working. Uh, so he ends up, you know, joining the Brotherhood as, you know, the leader. Even Because even though Pietro wants to, like, be the leader of the Brotherhood for Magneto, Magneto, in typical Magneto fashion, especially at the time, uh, he really treats you know, Pietro like crap where he doesn't see him, see him being competent enough and really not a good father. Uh, whereas like, I can't trust you to do most things. Uh, you're, you're a tool for me to use. And he sees like Scott and Wanda again, very cozy. And it's like, you know, I want to bring you two together because you like the son I should have kind of situation which is really really messed up and their first mission is planting a bomb at like you know in in uh was it brexit or uh, brexit is just like a meeting uh, but you know parliament that was the word i'm looking for they're playing a like like a explosive device and then after everything went off, Sky overhears well, we the fact that people got seriously hurt. A couple of them are dead. And he's like, what the hell? Nobody's supposed to die in this kind of thing. And, of course, Wanda's trying to calm him down. But he's really not trying to hear because that's not what he signed up for. And he ends up going back to McNeil to express the, that fact. Because it's like, no, we don't kill. We shouldn't kill. The innocent people they were talking about.
Then uh, we see, while this is going on, uh, the X-Men go to meet with the President of the United States, and he wanted to be the one to break it to Xavier that uh, when Scott went to go to Magneto, he took one of the planes, at least the extra planes. I don't, he, I don't think he took the actual Blackbird. But um, because he wasn't really using stealth, because uh, the Brotherhood, you know, their HQ is in the Savage Lands. And typically, they've been pretty much covered. Nobody can figure out where they are. But because Scott pretty much led like a big ass trail to them, the president. Uh, issue to have the Sentinels go to Genosha and stop Magneto so he won't pull a stunt like that again because it's kind of like a de de decoration of war essentially uh, so um, that's when like the it's kind of like in the old comics where Genosha gets pretty much uh, risen uh, uh, by a bunch of sentinel attacks or well in the comics it was kind of like a nuclear bomb but in like X-Men 97 it was like a bunch of sentinels or at least a kaiju sentinel pretty much tearing up everything uh, before we you know that even happens you know Xavier and Nick Scott has this kind of uh, conversation and he's telling Scott which shows him how much of a d-head of a father he is Whereas, like, uh, uh, next time uh, I see you, do you mind calling me father in front of when Pietro's nearby? Uh, just to, I don't know why. It's just uh, just to piss off your own kid, you know, like, break him down mentally and emotionally. That is really messed up. But then, of course, the Sentinels attack, and the Brotherhood and Scott and Xavier save, you know, as much people as possible in the initial attack. But still, a lot were still killed. Magneto uses powers to control the Sentinels and uh, take them out. But you would think, like, they, well, this is the first time they actually come across Magneto, so they wasn't because typically the Sentinels are uh, filled with stuff that prevents, you know, Magneto's magnetism from taking over. But since in this particular story, this is their first confrontation with Magneto and his abilities, so the Sentinels Sentinels are left vulnerable. So now, this was like. This was the last straw from Magneto. Now he's going to go straight to the White House and go after the president. But Cyclops is like, no, this is not something I, I'm down for at all. So he ends up uh, trying to get in contact with Xavier to give him a warning. Meanwhile... In DC, while Gene and Wolverine are in like a hotel room, pretty much doing it for at least a couple of times, I imagine. And he admits to the fact that why he why he was really, you know, among them and his purpose. She lashes out and and tries to go because after Xavier gets this, you know, warning everybody that uh, uh, the Sentinels are approaching. She's telling uh, Logan, like, do not, you know, come anywhere near us. Or I will kill you myself. Because Wolverine's trying to let her know that he completely changed his mind because he actually sees Xavier's dream. Actually, he buy into the fact that, yeah, Xavier's dream is probably a uh, 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 thing to admire. It's like, I can see this working. I didn't believe it at first. I didn't want to believe it at first, but you know, some things are changing in a way where it's like, 
have me have me believe. But she's not buying it by the sheer fact that he was infiltrating and manipulating in order to get close enough to take out Xavier. So she's not buying his change of heart. But while most of DC is evacuated, the Sentinels begin attacking and Xavier is pretty much like, okay, let's, you know, make a statement by taking down the White House and the present. So every other nation is on notice to not pull that stunt with him again. He literally has like the president, you know, completely naked while he's burning the American flag and the White House is up in flames. Hell of a statement saying that like, hey, this dude, you know, went to my home and annihilated a bunch of my people. So I'm going to make him an example. So that way, all the you other nations won't dare pull this stunt again, because I will do the same to you guys. So he's literally about to take him out, but Xavier shows up to prevent, like you know, the president being crushed to death by a bunch of automobiles. But uh, Magneto tosses him aside because he's in a metal, whittle, a metal wheelchair. Then, right. As he's about to kill uh, Xavier in front of, uh, of live cameras, Wolverine shows up behind him and stabs him in the back. So now, like, you know, after a couple of slashes, you know, Magneto's kind of like bleeding to death, you know, hoisted by his own petard, essentially. But he still had enough power to shove like a pipe through Wolverine's chest to neutralize him. But when Cyclops wants to get to uh, DC via the jet, but knowing for what I can't, he can't get there fast enough because Pietro points that out. But he, you know, you know, by assumption of what's happening off panel, he has like a sit down with, you know, Quicksilver. He has an idea like, I might not be able to get there fast enough, but you can. Do you want to really be like, you know, punch it back to your father? Stand up for yourself. Go out there and stop him. We need to, you know, stop him from, you know, causing like a mass catastrophe. So Quicksilver shows up in time and snatches away uh, Magneto's helmet, making him vulnerable to uh, Xavier's powers. And so, I'm not sure it's supposed to be setting up another onslaught situation, but for the Ultimate Universe, because that's what happened in like the onslaught uh, event, which I covered on the channel. But Xavier takes over uh, Magneto's mind, and he gets all these Sentinels and plowing right into M Magneto and. Uh, and an explosion happened, and Magneto's done for, essentially. So now the X Men once again are held as heroes because they saved not only the president, but like you know the country itself. But it was like an awesome display. Uh, like I said, the artwork is phenomenal. I really, really like the artwork. Okay. Uh, so that wraps up the Tomorrow People arc. So we're going to be getting to the second arc, the Weapon X arc, where we see Rafe uh, back at the Weapon X program stopping the other XKB Nightcrawler who his design seems more like he's literally like a demon from hell or something because his eyes and mouth kind of glow in a kind of in a kind of kind of in a ethereal yellow glow
And of course, he's young and he, he can't teleport uh, too far. And with and he can't teleport too many things or people at once like we know him to be able to do current times. But this is early years of a lot of these mutants that we know of. So their powers aren't totally in control or they haven't upped their game yet. So we see that Wolverine is out in Arizona trying to find like the old Weapon X facility with uh, Xavier in his mind trying to uh, try to salvage any kind of clues that he can. But they upped and move long after Wolverine escaped, fearing that he will come back with a vengeance. So now they don't know where they station at at this point. While this is going on, the rest of the X-Men are pretty much like on like this world tour thing where everybody's telling them as heroes. Currently right now they're in Japan. Uh, at least Storm, Colossus, and Scott are. Uh, so... Everybody's just asking for their autographs. And, of course, Colossus is the only one seems to be, well, a little bit with Storm. But Colossus seems uh, more so enjoying the accolades and the appreciation. Because it's, like, so new to them. Because it doesn't seem like, at first, they're being appreciative of being heroes. And, uh, of course... This mysterious woman shows up, puts her hand on a Colossus, and seemingly affects him. I'm not going to beat around the bush. It's Rogue. Rogue is one of the captured Weapon X uh, uh, prisoners under John Rafe. So, there's at least a few people that we know of, you know, are part of his Weapon X program, which is like a new ground here, because the only other people there's, you know, because we know Sabretooth and uh, Wolverine was part of the X Weapon X program, but no other X-Men character has ever been put underneath this program before. So we got Nightcrawler and Rogue. But we also see the ultimate version of the Juggernaut, who somehow got captured by these people and somehow detain which should be nearly impossible unless you're keeping him immobile because once he's on the move it's hard to stop him it takes a lot uh but then Sabretooth is there but he's there willingly like he is ready to do any and everything because he understands he will explain this to Wolverine later he understood his position he is an animal we're all animals so we should embrace it kind of thing as long as he just gets to indulge in his killings. But then uh, we see that Wolverine and Cyclops deal with this Russian mobster dude who helped, quote unquote, help his, uh, help Colossus' family so he can get him out of the whole situation in Russia. So Wolverine threatens to do is like, okay, from here on out, you know, Colossus' family's debt is paid. Don't bother him or his family ever again kind of thing oh and speaking of which Colossus first name is Peter or Peter well we in uh, the states spell it P-E-T-E-R Russians would have spelled it P-I-O-T-O-R and in this comic it's the first time I noticed that they went with the whole Americanized version of Peter while every Every other writer in every other instance, if they want to acknowledge Col uh, Colossus' first name, they properly pronounce it in the Russian variant. And maybe the, the writers here, because this, you know, Mark Millar was, you know, writing this, by the way. And maybe he kind of slipped his mind or something, or it wasn't really that big of a deal, so they just, like, let it be if they acknowledged it at all, but it's something that caught my eye. It's like, 
it's not how you would pronounce Peter's or Peter's name, considering he is Russian, and you gotta spell it in a particular fashion that is native to his country. I'm not saying I'm gonna stick with it for that, but it's something I noticed, and it seems like I don't know. It's like a nitpick, but something I had to address. And while this is going on, because X Men is kind of like a soap opera. Storm and Hank are getting kind of cozy with each other. And he tells Storm about the, his youth where, you know, he doesn't think this uh, feelings he has for her or what she feels for him is real because he tells her about how the some popular kids got one of the cheerleaders uh, to go out with him. But it was all like a ruse just to laugh at him or it just pretty much punking him because they didn't think nobody would actually, no pretty girl would actually consider going out with him the way he looks. So uh, Storm reassures him that this is not a gimmick that I'm playing on you. I actually feel something for you. So they end up making out during this picnic. And then, of course, you know, after what happened in the previous uh, uh, mission with uh, with Magneto, Bobby goes to visit his uh, folks to let him know he's okay. And he has a little girlfriend that he ends up apparently telling all the X-Men's business, even though Xavier pointed out to them, like, how important it is to keep, like, you know, what they got going on a secret. He ends up. And the fact that he. Thought things like. Oh I better. Co- mentally contact Jean. And let her know. Let her know like. Like. I'm seeking your counsel. Do you think. It's a good idea. That I mind wipe this kid. Because he pretty much. Just told all of our business. To his little girlfriend. And his parents. And we're trying to keep this. Tight lip. As much as possible. So. She agrees, but I don't know. He was going to do it. To me, I think Xavier was going to do it anyway. I don't, don't know why he's even bothered to ask, you know, Jean for her advice. And my wife's, the kid's uh, conversation he had with his parents and the girlfriend, where Colossus eventually asked, like, how was your girlfriend? And he's like, girlfriend, what are you talking about? He didn't just wipe away the conversation he had with them. He wiped away the entire moment. Uh, or even the fact that he had a girlfriend, period. And it's like, damn, is ever you could have at least been a little bit more precise and just wiped away the conversation. But you got to take away the entire girlfriend. It is just like kind of gross and invasive. And and of course, Wolverine hops on his motorcycle to veer off to uh, search for more clues about the whole Weapon X program. Uh, so he had to tell it out of there. And eventually, the place gets ambushed by uh, John Ray's little military uh, people. And they take out the psychics first, and then they end up going after the rest with uh, Sabretooth uh, leading the charge. And they're a little disappointed because Wolverine's been gone and left, so they can't even track him at this point because it's been a while. But they end up finding him later when he attempts to try to break in to save his team because now they're all captured and they're working under the Weapon X people and of course Bobby's trying to help out freezing everybody in place but Rogue shows up snatches some uh, of Gene's ability and mentally control or get inside Iceman's head where he thinks he's back in surgery getting his appendix removed but without his anesthesia you know the whole part about the anesthesia so he's feeling everything so it incapacitates him so the rest can knock him out 
So it's really kind of screwy. So now, uh, oh, and art was done by Tom Rainey. So I decided to bring that up. So now we see Ultimate Nick Fury, Sam Jackson, but before they actually lean into the Sam Jackson motif, where he actually got hair. So he's on a mission in India with this high-tech little suit going on, trying to get some uh, info uh, about what these you know terrorist groups, who they're working with and everything like that. But he's very smooth and everything like that, taking these folks out. You know, very easily, these little mercenary monks or whatever. And using his, his little gadget you know, spy glasses, he sends out this kind of like a beam of light where they turn into skeletons for some reason. It's comic books, man. But then a bright light flash, and somehow he gets knocked out and taken captured by these folks. He's never explained what that light was. But, uh, uh, we see Thaddeus Ross meeting up with, uh, John Wraith, who, uh, explains that, okay, we need to get Fury back from these people. So, uh, John's like, okay, I can send my folks, even though Ross doesn't. Like, like the idea of using mutants. It's not, I don't think he's like a mutant hater, but it's not like uh, something he willingly wants. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is not too long after the whole situation with the Hulk being created and everything like that. So he's weary on superpower people as a whole. So uh, John still ends up sending his team, which is our X Men. And, oh, he also has been experimenting on uh, Beast because when Jean was mending him, she utilized some experimental procedures that was being tested on lab animals with only rare occasions uh, the animals having their fur turn blue, which is supposed to have been like a less than one or two or three percent or something like that very small percentage but he wakes up from his coma with his hair blue and his eyes blue uh but now wraith's you know uh, uh doctors one of them being dr cornelius the one who created like the you know uh, the one who's you know in the mainline comic books started the Weapon X program and put the animanium in Wolverine's body. He's typically been depicted as like a bald-headed, uh, scrawny dude. Here, he has like a full luscious, you know, hair and beard and everything like that. And probably less of a dick here. Only slightly. But, uh, they experimented on Beast. And now he's actually like, the blue beast that we know of, which you'll see in a slide soon. But then, uh, Jean gets inside Nightcrawler's, Nightcrawler's head, asking who he was, uh, and where he's from, and everything like that. So they get acquainted with Nightcrawler. And here we are. We see him, you know, showing up with Shock Storm, which I'm pretty sure in the later issues put. A, uh, 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 a crinkle into that little budding relationship. Even though Beast got it on with a lot of women in the mainline comic books, maybe because they're low key furries, so they kind of got a, you know, probably got a thing for that kind of thing. Uh, who knows? I'm pretty sure. People realistically, a lot of ladies realistically will want to get on with Beast probably too because of that whole furry aspect about him. Because how many girls out there had a thing for that Robin Hood fox back in the day? 
So now, you know, the X-Men is being sent on these kind of missions, saving Fury, but another Splinter team with Nightcrawler and Cyclops go inside this facility, take them out the, taking out the guards, uh, and find this kind of amorphous blob that is barely sentient, you know, no more than a guy being like a vestible. And he's been ordered to take out that thing, even though Scott is hesitant, but Nightcrawler saves Scott from being taken out by some uh, soldiers or guards while they destroy this, you know, blob thing. Then uh, the initial orders for Gene and Storm was to pick up this scientist, but uh, John ends up getting some new orders, realizing, oh, we don't actually need this dude, so take him out. And Gene doesn't want to take out this dude. He's an innocent dude. He's unarmed. He's not a threat. But when Scott shows up, because it's very like Suicide Squad, they got like, you know, devices implanted in them. So John turns one on in Cyclops, causes him to reel in pain. So she ends up killing a dude with her powers, which is something that she's like, you know, beside herself about. That's it for that batch of slides. So we're on the last slide here. Now, uh, Iceman is freaking out and crying because he's a little kid, or at least a teenager, never been to this kind of situation before where he's literally held against his will. And Colossus tried to comfort, comfort him, explaining to him that you know, Wolverine will save us because he's been in a situation like this. He's our friend, so he wouldn't let this stand. But lo and behold, Sabretooth walks in with, you know, walks in dragging uh, Wolverine's unconscious body, saying like, yeah, he did try to come in here, but we stopped him. So now everybody's really worried because Wolverine was their lifeline. And nobody else knows that they're here. Not even the president, who's supposed to have been, like, on the side of the X-Men. But, of course, John is like, no, nah, I'm not having it. I don't care. We all buddy-buddy with the president. Like, you guys are a threat. But um, uh, we get this flashback sequence as uh, Nick Fury is going back to his home penthouse answering... Uh, uh, his uh, messages one of them being Wolverine which starts a flashback where a young Nick Fury is uh, being pinned down in a heat of battle against uh, some terrorist groups and mind you this is not too long after 9-11 so America is pretty much like like you know the go-to bad guys were like Taliban type terrorist groups. So uh, a frag goes off, you know, a lot of Fury's team were dead. He was injured, missing an eye. But then uh, one of the people, Wolverine, steps in uh, out of his little containment unit, takes out the terrorists and uh, uh, sorry. takes out the terrorist guys and hauls back, uh, uh, carries Nick Fury on his back to haul him back to uh, a U.S. base, 
where John is. And instead of being grateful or appreciative, a lot of the soldiers are allowed to just pretty much, you know, brutalize Wolverine. And while John is screaming like, don't let this fool you. He's an animal. And then they just shoot him as he's literally collapsed on the ground and just pretty much taking pop shots at him. It's just like, who's more of a monster? And nobody's saying anything. It's pretty much apathetic. But uh, Nick took notice. And Gene, in present day, Gene is apologizing to Wolverine where she didn't fully understand uh, him at first. But she's starting to understand now and why he does believe in uh, Professor Xavier's dream because he'd been through so much hell and then, you know, he, he was convinced by, you know, Xavier. But uh, Wolverine's telling her, like, you got nothing to apologize for. And as a matter of fact, everything's actually turning out pretty much how like, I would want it to turn out. Wolverine wouldn't have come in here without a plan because you think he's just like a dude who's just hacking slash. He's, you know, pretty good at strategizing. So he got his little chess moves going on. That's where, like, uh, uh, John, you know, sends, like, a, a video called Taurus Thunderbolt Ross and a bunch of other uh, military personnel who are planning on shutting down the Weapon X facility where John is not too thrilled about that because he sees what he's doing is more important and to you know to neutralize the potential mutant threat. So he got Xavier hooked up to this big machine with a you know retrofitted uh cerebral helmet. But I'm thinking like okay you're gonna use Xavier to take control of these guys' minds and kill them but they taken out by some bomb that uh, John impl- implanted into their little building at some point. I don't know. It's kind of cool. Or at least, you know, how much it would have meant if you actually written in a way that they would have been scared because he is about to use this mutant to take over their minds and cause them to hurt themselves or something. But instead, you take them out with a bomb. So it's kind of like, I don't know. I expected more since you want to show off what you did to Xavier. Which I'm not sure if, like, in the Ultimate Universe, Thunderbolt Ross actually died. I doubt it. But uh, we see that Saber 2 drags out Wolverine to show him uh, to show that, you know, all the files that they have on Wolverine takes out a, you know, they put up a grill you know, Saber 2 puts the file on the grill and begins to set it on fire saying like, this is all the information about you, you know your lean years, all that stuff up in smoke, so now you do have no idea uh, who you really are because especially after we scrambled your mind years ago well while this is carrying on and Sabretooth is kicking Wolverine in the dirt John Wraith is being called to meet up with Cornelius who notices uh, an abnormality inside Wolverine which turns out to be a tracking device and that's where the Brotherhood shows up to break out the X Men and Wanda using her Wanda using her powers to snatch all the devices out of uh, all the mutants' heads, so there's nothing stopping them from retaliating. Then uh, Wolverine and Sabretooth starts duking it out in the snow, and Wolf uh, and Sabretooth gets adamantium impl- impl- implanted inside him. And not just the fact that he has four claws on each fist because he always got the one-up Wolverine, but he also 
got to the point where he got animanium teeth. Sharp as hell. So now they end up duking it out. And once, you know, you know, security's been breached and everything's going up in smoke. John, in just like a petty bitch move, takes out his gun and shoots an unconscious uh, Xavier in the chest. And the Cornelius, of all people, had to point out, like, you're an idiot. He's the only person that's probably keeping those mutants from tearing our heads off right now. But he doesn't care because uh, he's like a pay little bitch. Uh, but uh, Cornelius knows that he got to save uh, Xavier's life. Hank shows up to try to find Xavier. And while he's trying to threaten Cornelius, Cornelius is like, Dr. McCoy, will you shut up and help me save this guy's life? So they end up saving Xavier's life. So get that part out of the way. And then in the fight between Wolverine and Sabretooth, uh, Sabretooth, you know, uh, attempts to drown Wolverine because the only way to destroy the brain so that way there's nothing to heal from. He pops his claws to pretty much snip uh, Sabretooth's junk and he kicks him off the ledge of a cliff. And it was kind of funny. But after they end up capturing and keeping John from escaping, everybody but Gene is ready to like, well, not everybody, but at least, you know, a few people, at least, well, the majority of the mutants there are ready to just get that pound of flesh off of John Wraith. But Gene and Colossus are like, no, we can't do this. We're, we're supposed to be homo superior. We need to start acting like it. But Storm ain't trying to have none of that. She attempts to electrocute John in his helicopter, but uh, Nightcrawler uses his teleporting abilities and teleport this dude out of there before it blows up. Uh, which, even though like Nightcrawler can't speak fluent English, he's been speaking German for this whole time, but... Uh, Pietro is luckily, uh, luckily Pietro is fluent in German, but you know earlier no, during their first Weapon X mission, Cyclops pointed out, "You guys didn't bother to teach this guy a basic fundamental English so we can be able to communicate." But John did not care. Uh, but despite what they put. Nightcrawler through, he still had a semblance of like, you know, like despite them being devils, you know, I gotta be the better angel kind of thing. But John attempts to shoot Nightcrawler, despite him saving his life, Nick Fury shows up in the nick of time <laughs> with a bunch of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and shoots uh, John Wraith himself. Because Wolverine ends up calling in a favor to Fury to come in to help them out. And Fury, knowing full well what, you know, was going on, not that full well, but understand what's been going on recently, he's like, I'm not going to have you guys arrested. Like, you all are free to go you know, back to your normal lives. We can handle it from here. So... Everybody going their separate ways. And the arc ends with uh, Gene speaking with Xavier as he's being, like, nursed back to health. And he mentioned about, like, well, everybody's going their separate ways. I'm a little surprised by the fact that uh, Kurt wanted to go back to Bavaria, but I expect him and Magneto to show back up on an, underneath this roof again soon. And Gene was like, uh, professor, maybe you still, you know, uh, out of it or you know, suffer some kind of like a short-term memory loss or something. But you know, Magneto's dead. You killed him. And Xavier points out to her, like, you know, I taught y'all better than that. You know, we won't take a life, and I did not take a life. 
uh, who says that my needle was dead. So, dun dun dun, and that's where this arc ends. This is twelve issues, mind you. It's a hundred issues going forward. As a matter of fact, I think uh, how the entire like, I want to say the ultimate universe ended because it ended through the, like the convergence of two worlds about to mass together. But there was like a big uh, flood situation caused by Magneto, and I imagine that's in like getting towards the 100th issue where he causes massive flood in New York which killed a lot of people and and that tells ducktails into the next bunch of uh, ne- next batch of uh, run at least the next run of Ultimate Spider-Man which will end up ducktailing into his death and into meeting Miles Morales and things like that uh, where hopefully this new batch of the new Ultimate Marvel Universe that's carrying on right now is a little bit more cohesive and like uh, you know everybody's you know understanding the assignment essentially but they're only doing like little bits and pieces of characters Ultimate Spider-Man Ultimate Black Panther and it says Ultimate X-Men but they're only talking about for right now the X-Men character Armor in Japan who's befriending this other kid who seemingly is Japanese as well but but has Storm's powers it seems like she has Storm's powers but it might be somebody else because Storm who uh, Storm shows up in Ultimate Black Panther teaming up with Ultimate version of Killmonger there's a whole nother thing uh I will get into like the new ultimate lineup, but whenever the those uh, particular uh, runs are done, that's when I'll probably get around to talking about it. But that is Ultimate X Men. So now to wrap up the X Men iconic events, I'll be getting right into. House of X and Powers of X, and that in and of itself is going to be like a very long uh, uh, a, a very long uh, review. So whenever I'm done, I'll get that review out. I was intending on doing like a reaction video of Destiny 2 again, but you know, I probably should do that when I don't have much to must v- other videos to work with on Saturdays. So I'm going to probably hold that off until next Saturday and get back into that then. Because I'm pretty sure by tomorrow, I'll, either tomorrow or Monday, I'll have the first season of Batman and the Anime series spoiler review ready uh, to discuss. Uh, so look out for that so I can go right into season two. But anyway, I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Have a great weekend. And let me know what you think of the Ultimate X-Men lineup. Have you read the entire 100 issues? If you did, how they all turn out? Was it, well, not spoiling, but was it generally good? Or it kind of veers off into some awful territory. But anyway, I'll see you guys n- next week, technically. And I suppose I got like a new chair, but God, it didn't turn out that way. But I, I ordered a new one. So this time by next Thursday, you'll notice I'll have like a brand new chair for the uh, for next Thursday's review. Anyway, that's enough preamble. I'm done. I'm going to chill for the rest of the afternoon. Take care of yourselves. Thank you for joining me. Bye. <laughs>